Let's get to it. Let me show you some verses you don't really believe. You stay in Proverbs chapter. Excellent. Uh, let me show you this one. I'm going to show you a verse in Matthew 6. It's embedded in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's right by, by that prayer, that very famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Y'all know that one, right? Where Jesus would pray like this. Here's an example of what you should include in your prayer. Our Father out in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, what's next? Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debt as as we forgive, as we forgive us our debts, as we choose to forgive our offenders. You've been paying attention to what you've been praying since you were a kid? As, as, we ignore that as, we pretend like that as in there, right? We're, we're praying, God, forgive me as much as I'm willing to forgive people who've hurt me. What a pain in the as that is, right? That's... <laughs> Terrible. As, as, A-S, A-S, one S. One S. One S. You won't forget it now, will you? So I know there are people in the room, you've been hurt so badly by someone. You, someone lied to you. Someone betrayed you. Someone abandoned you. Someone hurt you. Someone stole from you. They, they wounded someone you love. You're like, I can't forgive them. That wicked, sinful thing they did. But Jesus said, we're praying Father, forgive us as we forgive them. And in fact, if you're confused, let me show you the verses right now that many Christians don't really believe. The only part of that prayer that Jesus explains is not the daily bread part or my Father art in heaven part, right? The only part he explains is that forgiveness part. And so he puts uh, in Matthew 6, verse 14 and following on the screen right now, he says this right after the prayer. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins. Your father will not forgive you your sins. David, what does that even mean? Answer, I'm not sure I know. But I think it means that Jesus is super serious about this idea as saved people, as forgiven people. We forgive the people that hurt us. And I know you're very comfortable with your bitterness but God says, let it go. And when you choose to forgive them, the person you emancipate probably will be you. But I know lots of Christians who pretend like that verse is not in the Bible. Was that awkward? Let me show you a worse one. You stay in Proverbs. I'll take you to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 on the screen right now. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. Why? For God will judge the adulterer and all sexually immoral. Uh, okay. I know the sexual ethic of the Bible and our culture, very, very different, but the Bible teaches this. Doesn't teach, doesn't teach that sex is bad or sex is dirty. It teaches sex actually is blessed. Sex is a gift from God. God invented sex. Hugh Hefner did not invent sex. God invented sex. So therefore, it's good, it's sacred, it's special. And he says, like any precious thing, there's boundaries. You wrap around precious things. And so the exclusive place we express ourselves sexually is in the marriage bed. What is marriage? Listen, I know there's lots of conversation and debate in our culture. And if you disagree with my definition of marriage, guess what? Come back. We love you. Uh, listen, no one's trying to judge you. That's never my job. I know there's lots of controversy conversation. I know there are people in this church who believe a very different defini definition than the biblical definition. And guess what? Some of my favorite folks in the church. But it's my job as your pastor to share what the word of God clearly says. And the Bible says marriage is a man and a woman in a covenant relationship for life. That's what the Bible says. Um, well, some people, where does it say that? Like, like the Torah, like Moses, like a million years ago? Yes, it says in the Torah. But write this down. If you have any question about this, Matthew 19, verse 4. I see no one writing. Matthew 19, verse 4. Jesus weighs in. The king describes marriage as a man and a woman. So if you don't like that, don't get mad at me. I'm the errand boy. I'm the messenger. I'm the text message. Take it up with Jesus. You wrestle that to the ground with Jesus. So that means things based on this verse, things like extramarital sex or premarital sex, out of bounds. It's for the marriage bed. Even this, I really make you uncomfortable. Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, be careful about lust. Lust will mess you up. So things like pornography, out of bounds. 
It's so tense in this room right now. It's amazing. Y'all like all puckered up, like staring at me right now. I'll move on to another verse. Some of y'all don't believe that. You don't believe that you love God. You love the Bible, right? You're right, but you're not practicing what the Bible clearly teaches. How about this one? This is Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Whole different topic. Let's take a breath. Here we go. This one says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And someone's looking at that going, that's the stupidest thing I've ever read. What rom-com is that from? My goodness. What, what, what Hallmark card says it's more blessed to give? Because guess what? Receiving is awesome. Receiving is fun. I like to get. I like to have. And when I get some, I want more, right? I want to receive. I mean, giving's cute and everything, but no, I want to get. Who said that? Jesus said that. Jesus said that. He says it's more blessed, it's more sacred, it's more special, it's more powerful than to give than receive. So I'm gonna talk to you in the minutes that remain, like 13 minutes, about the idea of being generous. That as a person of faith, we should practice what this verse teaches and bless ourselves by blessing others. So I'm gonna teach you today about generosity. And if you're here and you're like a first time guest, you're like, oh, it's that kind of church. It's a money church. It's where the preacher talks about money all the time. Okay, so I get it, get it. So here's one of the most trending criticisms. Here's a critique on the church that's viral in our world. I hear this from unchurched people, from non-Christian people, and from some Christian people. Here's the complaint. The church just wants my money. The church just wants my money. The church is all about money, all right? You might, if you don't know me or know our church, you might think that is our agenda. And I would just simply point out this factor. We did not pass a plate today. We will not pass a plate today. Why y'all clapping for that? I don't even understand. Why y'all, no, I get it. I get it. We used to, in fact, we've done it maybe twice in the last uh, 15 years, but I think no matter what I say, if we pass a plate, it, it, there's this pressure on you, you know, to, to give. Even when I try to excuse you, if you're a guest, not a Christian, don't feel any need to do this, you feel bad about it. You put something in there and you get mad at me. We don't believe in guilt giving. Let me say it again. We don't believe in guilt giving. It's not biblical. It's not what we do. So I don't want to put any pressure on you. So if you think the church just wants my money and probably every sermon from this preacher is about money. I talk about giving uh, one Sunday, maybe two Sundays, but typically one Sunday a year. One Sunday in 52. Congratulations, you got the one Sunday. You got the one Sunday. Come back next week, different topic. But I just want to walk you through the many things the Bible says about this topic. And by the way, it's a pervasive biblical topic. Jesus talked about material things and generosity more than he talked about forgiveness, more than he talked about heaven, more than he talked about hell, more than he talked about family or children. He talked about giving and generosity and stewardship a lot. So I want to give you a survey. Just take a breath, no plate, no pressure. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't you dare feel guilty. Don't you feel guilty. That is not my goal. I, look, I'm not above it. But biblically it says, God loves a cheerful giver and says, do not give under compulsion where someone makes you feel bad or pressure. By the way, if I'm in a seat and someone does that, it makes me feel terrible. I don't want to give that way. So guess what? That is not a kind of giving that God enjoys. So let me give you just a Bible study today, a real simple Bible study on what the Bible says about giving and what God will do if we honor and actually believe what the Bible says. All right, you stay in, uh, you stay in Proverbs. Right around the corner is the book of Psalms. I think the most important issue when it comes to how I manage or how I give or what I do with my money is Psalm 24, verse 1. On the screen right now, it says, The earth is the Lord's and... God says, guess what? 100% of what you think is yours ain't yours. He goes, it's, it's mine. James says, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. Meaning this, anything in your life you got that is good is a gift from God. So the Bible says it all belongs to God. I, I know I feel like it's mine because my name is on the title or my name is on the deed, right? Or my name's on the mortgage, <laughs> But God says it all belongs to me. So all I do in life is I just manage God's stuff. Or the biblical word is I steward God's stuff. Or maybe I mismanage God's stuff. But the principle is here, if I manage God's stuff well, he may bless me with more of his stuff to manage. So the earth is, by the way, it's also not just a secret of generosity. It's also a secret of peace. Because say if my business 
is not really my business. It's God's business. I want to honor God by working hard and working smart. But if I'm struggling in business, guess what? That's his problem. It's his business. And therefore I have peace because God has and takes care of his stuff. All right. And so that's, that's why we understand this is so important. Now, how do we express to God? We understand that hundred percent of what I have belongs to him. Leviticus 27 verse 30 is on the screen right now. Ready? I, I want to read this, this first kind of half a word here. So here we, here we go. Here we go. Ready, ready, set one tenth. Okay. One tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. So if you heard the term tithing, it comes from statements like this. A tithe is an archaic English word that means a tenth. Why we use that word, I have no idea. It's like talking in King James English. The tithe means 10%. So to show God, I understand that 100% belongs to him, I bring him the tithe. I bring the tithe. I give the tithe to the house of God as an act of faith and obedience. That, that's, that's what I do because that's what the Bible teaches. Now, okay, David, great. So I, if I have 10% left after I pay all my bills, I'll do that. Proverbs 3, we're finally there. Did, did you look it up? Proverbs 3, uh, verse 9, uh, describes when I present the tithe. It says, honor the, by the way, this is not just about obedience. It's about honor. We serve a great God, a gracious God, a good God. And here's one very real, tangible way I gotta bring honor to my God. I gotta show him I get how good and generous he is. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So the Bible teaches the first thing I do before I pay FPNL or the mortgage company or whatever it is, blah, 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 Netflix and all the other things you subscribe to. The first thing I do is I bring the tithe. By the way, that's the language in the Bible. It is bring. It's never donate the tithe. It's not even give the tithe. Why? It belongs to God. So the same way if uh, I, I lent you my car, you borrowed my car. If I needed my car back, I wouldn't say, hey, hey, would you mind donating me my car? I, I wouldn't even say, you know, will you please give me my car? I would say, hey, would you mind bringing me my car? That's why it says bring the tithe, bring the tithe. So the first 10%. Now, again, you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You cannot out generous God. So here's some of these verses you don't believe. So you don't experience the promise or the blessing. So Proverbs 3, 9 is followed by Proverbs 3, not a trick question, 10, 10. <laughs> Look what it says. If I honor God with my tithe, the first it says one, two, three, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Amen. And based on your smattering of applause, you don't believe God. This is not me or some TV preacher going, if you bring the tithe, God's going to do blood. No, this is literally the word of God making you a promise. If you will trust him and do what the verses say, what God obliges himself to do. And this is not a one-off. Malachi 3.10 teaches the same thing. It's super clear. On the screen right now, it says, ready, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That is the temple storehouse. Some translations literally say the temple storehouse. This goes to the house of God. And by the way, the whole tithe. We believe in the inspiration of scripture that God put every word in your Bible on purpose. So the tithe is not because, okay, I'm gonna give some money to the church and I also give some money to my university and my favorite charity and my kids in a private Christian school. That's so expensive. And so all that's the tithe. No. In fact, the Christian school is a service being provided to you. That's not the tithe. Even grandma in the nursing home, please take care of grandma. That's not the tithe. The tithe goes to the house of God. But look what God promises. Like, Y'all are so uptight right now. Just unfold your arms, <laughs> relax. I'm not gonna ask you for anything. I'm not gonna pass a plate. If you're feeling guilty, shake that off. Shake it off. Look what God promises though, all right? And by the way, this is actually, this is not Malachi talking. This is God in the first person. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house so that I can do ministry. The ministry is resource. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. That is God. Test me, test me. He's talking smack. Try me, he says. 
Come on, I'm calling you out. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I would not throw open the floodgates. The what? The floodgates of heaven and pour out so much that your garage won't be big enough for it, that your storage shed won't be sufficient for it, that it will. This is God. Oh, I don't need me any of that. God, I'm fine. I got it. Floodgates, and overflowing vats. I, I, I don't know. Really? I want everything heaven has for me. Doesn't make me greedy, makes me smart. So some of the most incredible promises of God's willingness to bless us, they're attached to the faith action step of giving. Like, does somebody push you back? Well, I'm, I'm like a New Testament Christian. These are Old Testament. I'm a, okay, let me show you one of the New Testament. Uh, Luke chapter six, verse 38 on the screen right now. Read the first word, one, two, three. Yeah. So that's the action step. When I give, that's the catalytic activity. It's a tangible way to demonstrate my faith that I trust God. Give, and it will be given to you. And look at the promise. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, he poured into your lap. It's not proportional. God, I'll, I'll give you a hundred and you give me a hundred. No, no, God says, I'm richer than you. I'm so much richer than you. Uh, you know, God, I, I own the cattle on a thousand hill, hills. Okay, it breaks down because we're not ranchers. Uh, I own the Escalades on a thousand lots. <laughs> and I'm more generous than you are. You give and watch what I do. It's not always money, by the way. The best blessings of God, you cannot put a price tag on it. But God says, I, I will do this. So all I'm doing is like laying, and not like one or two, man. There's all these kind of promises in the Bible, and you're missing out because you're afraid to believe. This is not about your money. This is not about how we raise up our money. It's how we raise up our faith. So giving for me is never a financial issue. It's a faith issue. And uh, so I'll take you back to that first one, the one that I said you don't believe, Acts chapter 20. Where, by the way, Jesus said this in Luke 2. This is Jesus again. It's a Jesus promise. But Acts 20, verse 35, he says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so as we kind of were thinking through this series, you no know, uh, trending, you know, what's trending, what's making noise, what can we talk about in leverage? You know, do we talk about Travis and Taylor? I don't know, what do, we do? what do we do? What's making noise? We started to look at some influencers that might have a worthy message. You know, a lot of influencers, their messages are shaky and shady, but there's some that have really good ones about being kind, you know, about, about being other-centric. Well, there's a guy named Jimmy Darts. Jimmy Darts is big. Uh, he has, between all the formats, 24 million followers and subscribers. And uh, Jimmy Darts kind of teaches the idea of biblical generosity. So Charlie, my son, and Jimmy connected online and he kind of set up this deal where they actually had a chance to meet. So we interviewed Jimmy Darts and Jimmy just practices biblical generosity. And we didn't know ahead of time that he's a Christian. He's a Christian. So we interviewed him. I want you to see the beauty demonstrated of what I would say is biblical generosity, how you cannot outgive God. Check out this video. Hey church, my name is Charlie. I'm a pastor on staff and currently myself and some of the video team are here in Los Angeles, the land that is full of social media personalities and influencers because we're here to interview one of my favorite influencers. Find the first person to give you a hug and give them $500. His name is Jimmy Darts. He's 27 years old, he loves Jesus. He's a massive following of over 23 million people across all platforms. You amazing people have donated over $6,000 for him to help him get off the street. He makes videos of random acts of kindness and radical generosity. We hope you enjoy this conversation. You're amazing. God only made one of you. What are you up to? Well, Man, right been... now I'm, a, I'm, called, I'm called a homeless vet and trying to, trying to get back over to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma with my son. I'm trying to go to the grocery store, actually. You don't have like a dollar. I have something. a quarter. Really? That will work. Well, it would help mean, towards what I'm trying to get. I got more than that. I got 50. What's your name? Roy. Roy, good to meet you, Roy. Good to meet you. I'm Jimmy. Jimmy? Good to meet you, Roy. Are you homeless too? Or? Uh, no, Roy. Here, actually, take this. No, I don't, I don't need it. I want Why? you to take this. I got five hundred dollars for you. you. Yes. Why? Because I'm rewarding your. Before you often bless people in your videos, 
you'll first test their generosity. Yeah, yeah. Where'd you get the idea for that? What made you think like, this is the way I want to go about it? Like first testing them before you bless them. You know, when someone does something, it reveals a lot about their heart, you know? For good things and for bad things, you know? When somebody's generous, it shows a lot of what's going on inside and it shows that they're ready to handle blessing because when we hold on to money or anything like this, one, we're greedy and we're not letting it go. And two, you know, if you tried putting a dollar in my hand right now, it'd just roll right off. And so God can't wow. bless us when we're not generous. And when we're generous, we can give and we can receive. And when these people give, I go, wow, they're a giving generous person. They're gonna be able to steward, not 100% all the time, but for the most part, they're gonna be able to handle a blessing that comes. Hey, help me, man. I was gonna go get something to eat, but on my wallet, could you grab me just one taco? No, cool? wait. Could you just get one taco, man? I'm just hungry. I'll get you. I just, really? Yeah, thank you so much, bro. For sure. Man, why did you, why did you help me? The right thing to do. I actually did have my wallet today. God, this I guy. got five hundred dollars for you, man, for being so kind to give me a meal. For real? Yes, because you stepped out and were kind, man. Oh, There's man. so many awesome people all over the country, and these people that I ask for help when they help me. It's not their first time helping someone. They've been doing that their whole life and never once got noticed for it. But in that moment, hidden camera without them knowing. 10 million people or something are gonna see it and they're gonna become the superhero of their yeah. town. So you were being generous at times when, to an outsider's perspective, it did not make sense for you to be generous. So maybe speak for a moment to those who feel like, I'm not in the position right now to exercise generosity. What would you say to that person? Yeah, man, I would just say that, you know, you wanna listen to Pops and do what God's telling you, you know? And when God talks about generosity and even tithing and things like that, like, if you, if, you, if you know who God is and you know his nature, you have a relationship with him, you know he's amazing. And you know he's not trying to screw you over. You know he's incredible. And so, you know, if you're making a dollar a month, give 10 cents away, you know, yeah. to, to the church or to someone to bless someone. Because when you honor God with those first fruits, like it's so powerful what he'll do. He'll bless the rest of it. Yeah. Is there any one story or moment where you bless somebody that's your favorite? Yeah, my favorite one ever was uh, was Jose. I woke up that morning, was praying, and I said, God, what kind of video should we do today? And he said, Jimmy, go around and ask someone for a hug. And I was like, that's the most simple thing ever. But it's not always about the craziest idea. It's if there's glory on it. Mm. And so I was like, all right, I'm asking someone for a hug. So I drive around town all day for hours, and I'm about to go up to people asking for a hug, and I just feel no peace and no presence on it. I'm like, what in the world? So what do you mean? You want me to hug myself, you know? And uh, he's like, no, I'll be patient. And so I'm like, all right, well, the sun's setting. It's time to, you know, end the day. So I'm driving home thinking, well, I just walked around in circles all day. Nothing happened. I'm driving back home and I see this guy on a bike on the side of the road, just biking. And I could tell he was just got done painting. His clothes were all dirty and stuff. And I, I just knew that is the guy. So I whipped the car over, sprint over, and then walk slowly so he thinks I'm coming around the corner. And I said, man, sorry to bother you, man. Could I get a hug? I had a long day. I haven't seen family in a while. I just need a hug, man. He stops his bike with his feet because the brakes don't even work. Gives me a hug. I said, man, what's your name, Jose? Jose, I want to give you 500 bucks for being so awesome giving me a hug. He just loves you. <laughs> God's got you, bro. He's got you, man. It's a miracle for me, man. What's that? It's a miracle for me. It's a miracle. This grown man just breaks down in tears, starts weeping, and he goes, today at work, the boss paid everybody except for me. And he's been getting taken advantage of because he was a, like a legal immigrant from El Salvador. It was so sad, and I was like, what's your story, man? And he goes, yeah, I haven't seen my wife and kids in 18 years, just on FaceTime, and I work and send them money. And I told my wife, I'm gonna be home this Christmas. And she goes, you can't come on, what are you crazy? You never saved the money, you never made it. Like the whole point was to go to provide. If you come back now, we'll be in the same place. And he goes, no, God's gonna do something. And I end up raising around 50 grand for this guy. Wow. He ends up moving home to El Salvador in time for Christmas, hugs his wife at the airport, and his life is off to the races. And what unlocked that for him, I believe, is one, his faith of saying, I'm coming back for Christmas, God's gonna do something. And two, him choosing to forgive. That's the most rewarding thing for me, man. Because when someone's kicked, 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 and they're on the ground and they're lonely and dark, man, it's just a scary place. And, you know, sometimes just having a friend and someone to help you out can change everything. So just meet these awesome people that yeah. we're gonna be spending in eternity with forever, yeah. you know? So, so that, that's, that's priceless.
What is drawing people to Jimmy's videos is that dynamic, it is more blessed to give. And that's what, it's, it's funny, our flesh, our immaturity fights that. So again, some action steps today. Listen, uh, I need some of y'all from this service to go help me downtown. So we're starting at First Baptist uh, next week, a service just like this, come help build something, be unselfish, and help us re- take you know, what we've done here and re- reproduce it over there. It's gonna be amazing what God's gonna do. And I think he's gonna build a giant thing. I need your help. If you do wanna give, here are the ways that you can give at our church. I don't wanna spend much time on this, but there are some ways you can give. Feel free, unless you feel guilty, then don't give. Uh, by the way, I never have ever taught partial obedience with this before. Like, hey, if you can't do a tithe, just give something. Because I, I feel weird about that because we're not fully obeying God. But I think maybe just get started. This is not like, hey, I'm dealing crack, but now I'm gonna deal crack on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's different. <laughs> Start giving something. Give, give 1%, give 2%, but give something that hurts. Make a sacrifice. Some of y'all are like, I'm so in debt, I can't. So number one, you take Financial Peace University in January. You're gonna figure out how to get free. You gotta make that pledge. If you cannot tithe right now, you gotta make that promise to God because God wants you freed up financially. And then give something. Give up something that you can give. So I'm so broke. Yeah, but you still go to Starbucks because it's October and you get your latte, pumpkin spice, whatever. Gosh, you're spending $100 a month on that. Why don't you give that? Why don't you give that? Give something. If we're not giving, it's immaturity. I got a friend up here. What's up? Your name is Sir? Benjamin. Benjamin, a little louder. Benjamin. And what campus? You know what? You go to Lake Worth campus? Yes. You do, and your dad's Pastor Rob, right? He's one of our church kids. Get up for Benjamin right here. And I want to bring Benjamin up because I heard that Benjamin really likes Skittles. And so these are my Skittles, but I'd like to bless you with these Skittles. Do you like some Skittles today? All right, you enjoy those, eat those Skittles, have a little fun while I tell this story. So uh, Charlie, my, my oldest, you know, in the video, Charlie looks like he's 33, but he's just 23. But back when he was three, if I wanted Charlie to go fishing or go to a ball game with me, the secret was this, he loved food. Mike, he loved junk food. So I, if I would just feed him chips or nachos the whole time. So we're at a baseball game for the Marlins, back when the Marlins were terrible. There's no one in the stadium. We're like in a row by ourselves. And here's my little three-year-old baseball cap on, cute as he can be. I fed him a hot dog and a Sprite and nachos. I used to have a great picture with blue all over his face because he ate some cotton candy. And the last thing, we went back to the concession stand, Benjamin, like six times. So what do you want next? He goes, I want Skittles. He loves Skittles. So I took him back to the seat, Benjamin, and he's like three. And I gave him, like I just gave you those Skittles. And the moment I gave him those open Skittles, I said, hey buddy, can I have a Skittle? We, can you guess, in fact, if I asked you to have a Skittle, would you? He gave me a Skittle. That's, that's a nice, mature little boy. I won't put my mouth because I'm trying to talk. Um, I asked Charlie for a Skittle like three seconds after I gave him the bag. And Charlie, as a little boy said, no. <laughs> and then he said, my Skittles. Now, Charlie was a nice kid. He, he was a kind kid. But in his immaturity, he said, no. My, what he did not know was theologically, I am the father. I was the source of his Skittles. I'm a powerful father. I could have snatched the Skittles back for him and said, no Skittles. You won't share Skittles with me. No Skittles for you, right? I didn't do that. He kept his Skittles. You keep those Skittles. But Benjamin, what he didn't know was, if he would have blessed me with a Skittle, I could have felt so moved to bless him back. What, what's that verse say? Give me that verse, verse in Luke. Give and we give to you a good measure, pressed down, shake it. I could have gone back to that concession stand, swipe my debit card. Guess what, Benjamin, you're now the stunt kid. Are you covered up? Are you good? And I could have blessed him with so many Skittles. I could have showered that boy with an avalanche of Skittles. You okay? You good? You got some in your neck here? Anywhere? Going in? Go anywhere? That's what God promises to do in our life. But how many, wait, because you don't believe God in this area. Christian, you live under the tyranny of a self-imposed micro-recession. See, money is one of the main ways we express we believe. We believe. Why? Because we all need money. We all think about money all the time, right? You spend money, 
every day. Look, you stare at me. Do you get your groceries at Publix for your good looks? No, you have to give them money. You work to make money. Anything we traffic in that much, God cares about it. Trust Him. And by the way, if you're here and you're a non-Christian, uh, and you're thinking, oh, that's it, God just wants my wallet. Oh, no, He's way more ambitious than that. He wants you, He wants your life. Come to a prayer partner today, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Good job, by the way. Thank you so much for the fact you make these promises, but you require us to trust you, to take action first. Give and we given to you. It's more blessed to give than receive. Lord, we'll just simply believe what the Bible says in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.